Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's a really hard act to follow, but I'm going to try. So my name is Jim Stewart, and I'm here with my colleague Heather Gore. We're from the MathWorks. And we're going to talk today about um, deploying a AI for near real-time manufacturing decisions. More specifically, we're going to talk about the subject of predictive maintenance. Predictive maintenance is the science of monitoring industrial equipment and uh, for faults and also predicting the remaining useful life of those assets. And there's this really uh, specific kind of technology stack that you need to build to be able to do that right, and we're going to walk you through an example today that builds up a whole system from scratch and, uh, uh, you know, shows, shows how to do it. So we're going to walk you through an example problem today. And what we're going to do is we're going to develop and operationalize a machine learning model to monitor failures in industrial pumps. And the way that we're going to do it is we're going to actually walk you through the whole, a whole project that we did to actually build this system. And as we're talking, we're going to uh, be giving you the, 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 the progress of our project through the perspective of a couple of different personas. The first persona in our, in our system here is at what we're going to call a process engineer, and this is a person that uses MATLAB and Simulink to develop models for, for their assets. And that role is going to be played by Heather, and she's going to walk you through the whole process of, of building models. Uh, the second persona that we have in our project here is what we're going to call a system architect. And this is a person whose, whose job it is to basically take the models that Heather develops and operationalize those in a production environment so that we can actually start streaming data uh, from our assets through them. And I'll play that role myself and I'll, I'll walk you through the, the process that we, we, we took to build that system. And uh, our third persona is, our, is actually our customer. It's actually our end user. And uh, we're going to call him the plant operator. This is the person that needs uh, to take the output of Heather's model and make decisions about it. And as you can see, he's, he's kind of unhappy today, right? He's, he's got, he's has a lot of problems with his, with his equipment. And, and hopefully by the end of this session, we'll put a smile on this guy's face. OK. So the first thing we did before we started our project is we met with our, our customer and uh, we talked to him about some of the things that he, that he needs uh, in the system. And we decided that we were gonna build, we were gonna build out a full, a full working system that we could put in front of him in a three to four week sprint. And so the first thing we did is we got his requirements. So he basically has three uh, things that he's interested in. What, the first thing that he needs to know is he needs to know the operational state of all his assets, and he needs to know that in kind of near real time, right? And he also needs to be alerted when there's some kind of failure happens uh, in, in the system. And the other thing that he needs to know is he, he needs to know uh, some accumulated uh, values that represent the remaining useful life of the assets so that he can make decisions about replacing and, and, and maintaining the equipment. Now, before we start, we actually have a lot of constraints and a lot of challenges with, with a project like this. The first huge problem that we have is we don't have a large set of failure data, and it's very costly to generate uh, failure data in our plant, and we're just not going to do that. So, what we're going to do is, is we're going to build a very accurate physics-based model uh, for the asset, and we're going to use that to generate synthetic data that we will then use to train our machine learning model. The second big constraint that we have is we don't have a large IT and hardware budget, and we really need to show some results before there's going to be a commitment uh, uh, to, to a particular technology or platform. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to uh, leverage the cloud to do this. We're going to use uh, as many uh, pre, you know, pre-programmed uh, uh, solutions as we can, and we're going to um, operationalize these things with some of our products. And another, uh, this is also a, a really big challenge with projects like this. Is these these projects like this tend to be very multidisciplinary. We have 
multiple domains that we have to uh, we have to have expertise in. We have to be experts in signal processing, uh, physics, machine learning. We also have to have expertise in IT and um, and and system you know system design and things like that. And so. Our solution for that is to use a platform that brings all these things together and integrates well with, with uh, cloud uh, services as well as best in breed open source software. So uh, this is a, a quick look at the architecture that we're gonna build. I'm not gonna take, I'm not gonna describe that too much right now. We're gonna come back to this a few times during the talk. And uh, what we've done is we've built out an, uh, we, we've, we've built out a system that basically has four basic parts. Uh, over on the left side, uh, there's our assets, which are basically going to, in this case, are going to be our pumps. They stream data into a production environment, uh, and, and this is uh, something that we've built on, on the Azure cloud. Uh, and on the upper right par, uh, uh, quadrant, we've got our development environment. That's where Heather's going to do her work and build her her model. And then finally, in our lower right-hand corner, uh, we have our end user, and this is, uh, this is actually on-site in the plant, and we're going to build this guy a dashboard so that he can, he can, he can uh, you know, un understand what's happening. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand it over to Heather, and she's going to walk you through the whole design and implementation process of her model. Right, thanks, Jim. So uh, just to kind of step back and look at the approach before we dive in, uh, it's very similar to similar problems like this that you probably face daily, right? So you get your data, pre-process, we'll spend a lot of time talking about the predictive modeling part, and then the integration part. And not just integrating, but what sort of things you need to think about whenever you're building the model, you know, thinking ahead to the next step. And then ultimately, what sort of results that we need to visualize uh, for our plant operator to make the right kind of decisions. And so again, uh, I'd love to just dive in, but I need to kind of step back and review the requirements. And it's a big project. And so our operator needs uh, blocking, you know, he needs to know what kind of fault is happening so he knows how to react, right? So if it's blocked, it's uh, got a leaking pump. And then, uh, like Jim mentioned, the continuous remaining useful life. So he always knows, uh, you know, can prepare ahead for each of the pumps. Then there's different requirements from the system architect, so I need to think very carefully about the window for streaming, right? So I'm gonna be getting in packets of data or you know, uh, one chunk at a time. And so I need to think about that before I even start implementing the model because I, I need to make sure that this is gonna be reasonable, enough, you know, enough data with enough uh, time resolution to build a model like this. Then we'll also have to come to an agreement sort of as a team on the format of the results. You know, uh, we're going to be passing this data into a bunch of different systems, and so not, it's not just for me, um, but, you know, we want to make sure that this is a good uh, structure, you know, JSON, so we can pass it around to all the different systems. Of course, we're going to have to scale this out. I'm going to start with one or two pumps, but, you know, we have hundreds of pumps in our plant. And then, of course, it, I'll be a responsible citizen and test my code before uh, passing it along or, you know, pushing it. And so, you know, we're talking about this pump, let's just kind of think about you know, what, what is this thing uh, before we start modeling, right? So it's, it's sort of a typical sort of pump, <laughs> you can imagine, inlet, outlet, you can see it pumping along. Um, but there are, importantly, there's three different types of uh, failure modes, right? So uh, you could have, um, you know, friction in the crankshaft, so some bearing friction, also a leak, you know, obviously that's, that's bad. Uh, and then a blocked you know, valve or blocked inlet. And so those are the three uh, components or the three failure modes that we've identified and that we can use in our uh, modeling. And so in reality, we're actually gonna have, eventually we'll have a real pump um, and that will have some sensors on it and then we'll also kind of be able to uh, justify our algorithm and you know, make sure that we're informing the right kind of diagnoses. And so at this point, you know, we gotta start bringing in our data, really looking at it. And so I, I sort of hinted at this. We actually don't have a pump. We're a software company. We sort of pump software and knowledge and mathematics uh, into the world. Um, but you know, we actually will uh, you know, collaborate her perhaps with someone who does have a pump. But so it's really great because uh, you know, he mentioned he saw, you saw the operator. He wasn't having a very good day. We don't want to break all of the pumps just to get some data to build our model, right? So uh, we can simulate it, and we have a, we, a good knowledge of the physics of this pump. You know, there's uh, many pumps like this. We have a CAD model. We can just bring that in and actually start simulating. Um, and so, you know, we can use a nice um, digital twin for this, and you know, 
can see it's pretty close, and then we'll introduce these faults. And so, again, this is a, a much better way to build out failure data than literally just breaking all of your pumps and going with that. And so just to kind of show uh, what this looks like as it's being simulated, this is our digital twin uh, built in Simulink. Uh, again, a vast kind of physical modeling tool. And again, here's where we can see uh, introducing our, our faults. And so this had a blocked inlet and a leak. And so we're going to do this over and over and over again in order to build up our data set. And it's big data Spain. I should talk about the big data aspects, right? And so, you know, again, we want to make sure we have a really good data set. We, we can uh, span all of the ranges that we believe are uh, faulty, and uh, we'll just we'll scale this out too. So even our uh, simulations, we can run in parallel. We can run on a cluster. You know, these are pretty. These can get pretty big, intensive jobs. Then it's actually it's pretty easy to just bring it into MATLAB and start uh, messing around. But again, this is a bunch of data, so you again sort of have to think ahead of where we want to store this, how we're going to share it with a team. Uh, and in this case, I decided to store it on HDFS, um, mostly because I was uh, wanted to uh, take advantage of Spark uh, for machine learning. And so. You know, thinking about pre-processing, I think lots of us spend lots and lots of time doing this. Uh, some of the time pre-processing is actually going to be done, Jim will talk more detail about this, but it's actually done uh, through Kafka, and they, they do some of that ahead of time. So it saves me a little bit of a headache, but I still need to do some time series pre-processing, like synchronization, you know, making sure everything is on the same uh, you know, scale. And then, of course, normalizing, you know, kind of your typical uh, machine learning prep. But in this case, we've got sensor data. Right? And so uh, there's frequency domain. I, I spend a lot of time in the time domain myself. So when I need to enter the frequency domain, I try to visualize uh, and try to understand what might represent my signals the best. And so you, know, you can kind of explore a little bit, but ultimately I ended up using sort of your standard uh, feature representations, your spectral information, you know, RMS values, statistical values, those kinds of things. And again, we're just kind of pulling out all, that, uh, all the features that matter. And so we're take a step back, kind of where are we now? So we've done some labeling uh, from our uh, simulated data, represented our signals. We're going to start training some models. We'll validate. And we're going to do this on a, a smaller subset of data so I can kind of work you know, on my desktop or something local. And then we'll scale this out. Like I mentioned, we'll you know, use Spark and uh, do that machine learning uh, pretty easily there. And so thinking about the models, um, we mentioned that the plant operator needs the type of fault. So is it leaking? Is it blocking? That sort of thing. Uh, and so that's a classification problem. And then also the remaining useful life is a regression problem. Right? So this is sort of an exponential degradation uh, kind of problem. So that's uh, you know, numeric regression. So uh, for the uh, fault type, um, one of the things that had some indication of what I needed uh, I know that I want to you know, not use the flags that I had. I just want the um, actual you know, uh, response value. I, I thought this might be a nonlinear problem, but I can actually just try all of the machine learning models. It's a three-week sprint. I need to kind of get where I'm going really fast. right? And so I can try a bunch of different models. You can see already that there's some separation. And so that indicates that I'll probably you know, be able to uh, come up with a good model. Uh, so, you know, I kind of explored around a little bit just to kind of, again, make sure that the data was separating enough to make sure our, our features were right. Take a look at the confusion matrix. Looks good enough for, especially for a three-week sprint. You know, like, yeah, I'll definitely come back to this later and, you know, try to get better results. But at this point, I'll just save out the model, and then I can actually use it in the next step to start predicting on the real data. And so that takes care of the classification problem. What about this remaining useful life? And so it's a regression problem, like I mentioned. Um, and this video kind of shows, with, with this problem, every data point, we're going to update the model. So we'll update the state of the model. And as you can see, it actually improves you know, as it gets more data. You know, the confidence interval is shrinking. So we're, we're in good shape. But again, this is something we really have to think about, and even as a team, because we need to build this into our architecture. Because we're going to save out the state, and then again, uh, apply the new one every time we get a new uh, data point. And so you know, I, I sort of keep talking about this next step. That's uh, the streaming part. Where, so we're going to have incoming data, uh, not as much as we had to build the model. So, so far, we've been talking about batch processing. right? And so we had all of our historical data, which was simulated, trained our model, scaled it up, and then you know, started making some predictions. But 
again, you need to think ahead a little bit about the incoming data as uh, you know, it's, it's coming in a little packet at a time. I'm going to apply a function that captures all of the things I just did and then you know, update the state like I talked about and then uh, push out the information to the dashboard and so that our operator can take a look. And so we'll dive in now to the streaming part. And like I said, this is basically what I just kind of walked through. So we you know, did our pre-processing, our predictions. Um, you know, we're bringing in that chunk of data. In our case, we decided on one second because we have very uh, granular resolution. So we want to you know, make sure we have enough. And we also pass in the old state. And so again, the, we'll, uh, later in the code, we update the state and we write the results back to a stream so that our uh, operator can see everything coming in as it goes. I promised I would test and be a good citizen. Uh, so I, can, you know, I set up just a couple quick unit tests, very straightforward. But we also could test this in reality, you know, in our full architecture. And so uh, there's, Jim's actually going to show this once the, more of the architecture is built out. And so again, you know, I'll test locally at this point, but we'll come back to really uh, more serious testing to make sure it's ready to go. At this point, I package up what I've done. So I, I take my streaming function, I take any uh, dependencies, uh, you know, it'll find these in the app, and then I basically pass this along to Jim. And so before I do that, I want to make sure I check in with everybody. Uh, with the operator, I want to share the results, so I need to make sure that these, uh, you know, the data look right and the fault values look reasonable. And then, of course, with the system architect, I can just push the code. You know, we can just use uh, source control, no big deal. And so uh, now I'm actually going to turn it over to Jim, who's going to walk you through uh, building this out in the architecture. OK, thanks, Heather. Uh, <clears throat> before we start diving into the architecture, I just want to take a quick review of our requirements that we have. And there's some things that I need to know before I start doing my work here. Um, we just saw a lot of uh, uh, signal processing and a lot of algorithms that, that Heather designed. And these things actually have implications. Uh, the, the, her choices of algorithms and techniques actually have implications on how we need to present the data to the, uh, to the code in order to get the right answer. Right? So we know that we're going to have a very fixed timestamp. We know that because of the frequency resolution we have, we need a very specific size window, or at least a minimum size window. And uh, I've been told that initially we're going to prototype with a few, but eventually if, we, if we're successful and we run this on our whole plan, it'll scale to hundreds or more. So, I, so the technology choices that I make actually have to, uh, uh, have to be things that we can actually scale up if, if, if needed. Uh, and of course, our requirements from our operator, our operator needs a good visual um, dashboard of some kind so that he can get alerts when, pr when, when, when there's failures, he can uh, and get, uh, ha have a way to just query the remaining useful life of his assets, right? So we're going to make sure we get that in there. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to focus really on the middle box, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, for the next several slides, I'm going to actually talk about how we built the system out. So uh, the, our production environment has five basic pieces. And uh, our, first, uh, piece, uh, our first piece I want to talk about um, is Apache Kafka. We decided to use that uh, uh, to, to ingest our data. And uh, we chose that because it's a, it's a very robust system, and it and it's also, it's also sets us up in the future. If we really needed to scale up, we'd be able to do it. Uh, we built a connector for Kafka uh, that feeds the data from Kafka into our MATLAB code and, and, and implements a lot of very important features that we need to make sure that we get it right. And we deployed that uh, on Azure using Docker. We built a, a, a microservice. We, uh, we, we deploy it through Docker using, uh, on Azure using a feature called Azure Container Instances. And we found those to be very easy to work with. It's a very nice feature in Azure that lets you uh, deploy just a standalone container, and it's really good for these stateless microservices that you need to build to be able to connect stuff together. Um, we're, we also uh, uh, provisioned a MATLAB production server. Uh, MATLAB production server is a product that enables you to deploy your MATLAB code as a function as a service, right? And, and, and the function of a service style of, of uh, deployment is a really nice fit for stream processing. And so we have this tool 
uh, that we can use to, to, to get to, to, to fit really nicely into this architecture. And as Heather mentioned, we need to update this model. We have a model that needs to be updated. It's a stateful model that needs to be updated. And we need a very high performance, kind of low latency store for that for, because it's, it's, it's what we typically refer to as hot data. It's something that we really need to be available. So what we did is we provisioned ourselves a Redis cache um, in Azure and uh, we, we built some connectivity in uh, to be able to talk to that. Uh, we also uh, want to ingest all of our data as well as our results. Uh, so we also built a, we also, there's an arrow going from production server back to Kafka. We're actually gonna feed our results back to Kafka as another time series. And we uh, also, for the benefit of our dashboard, we also have a storage layer that we need and, and so that what we, we can do is, is we can durably store all of the, the, the raw data that's coming in as well as the outputs of our model. Uh, and we've used Elasticsearch for that. And not, not shown on this picture, we actually used the technology we used to get from Kafka to Elasticsearch was, was we used Kafka Connect, which is a very nice uh, connector from Confluent that lets you dump your Kafka data directly into Elasticsearch and it indexes it for you. And it's a, it's a, it, it, we, we found that to be very helpful. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna take a, start taking a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the components we use. Um, this is MATLAB Production Server. We've made it available on Azure. Uh, it's easy to run on Azure. Uh, the whole thing's driven by an ARM template. And uh, we provision a whole stack for you so that you can get up and running. And uh, we also provide, uh, there's a lot of connectors available for production server that enable you to connect to your data. So we have streaming, we have connectors that, that'll, that'll put streaming, that'll, that'll attach streaming data to the server. And we also have connectors for storage and databases as well. So um, I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into our Kafka connector. This is the one piece of the system that we actually spent uh, uh, some, some serious time on, right? We, we, we uh, had some very specific requirements that we had to meet uh, for our streaming data. So what we did is we built uh, a very simple connector, but, but powerful connector that, that we deploy as a microservice uh, using Docker. Uh, we also built a publisher for Kafka, a very simple publisher that just lets us push our results back uh, to, to a derived stream. And there, there was a lot of, there's a, several very important requirements that we had to meet uh, with this part of the system. Uh, first of all, a production server is an application server and it uses HTTP, so we had to kind of bridge the difference between streaming data and request response. So what we had to do was build a system that knew how to batch data in, into the proper batches and send it to the server. We mentioned earlier that, that the algorithms we're using require very precise uh, definition of time and when things are happening in the system. Okay, so we can't use ingest time as our, as our timestamps. We actually have to take the timestamps of the events that are happening on the pumps themselves and we have to make sure we put them back together in the right order because, they, because in a production environment, these things may not always arrive in the order that they were produced um, out on the edge. And we, of course, we need to bucket these things into time windows because we're doing signal processing and we need very specific um, uh, uh, time definition there. We also need to do asynchronous processing for two reasons. Uh, our processing on the server is done asynchronously for performance reasons, number one. But number two, we also have an interactive workflow that we want to support. We would like to support the ability for a developer to debug on live streaming data. And that's actually a really hard problem. And so uh, we decided that we really needed to, to implement a, a, a little bit more, a, a more advanced uh, pro, uh, uh, execution model than you'll find with a typical Kafka uh, a connector. Um, and, you know, of course, we have a lot of orchestration that we have to do under the covers. We have to be able to manage, particularly for our state store, we have to be able to manage the, the keys correctly in our Redis cache so that we're not stepping, different partitions aren't stepping on each other, right? And we also want to make, fully exploit Kafka's partition model so that we can um, scale up in the future if we have to. 
And what we also want to, uh, the other requirement we had was to pass, we want to pass our data as, uh, there's a, as, a, as a, a MATLAB timetable. A timetable is a MATLAB data type that is, is uh, very well uh, tuned and designed for doing time series uh, data. And so we wanted to make sure that we could make that really easy. The last thing I want to do is go back to Heather and say, oh, by the way, Heather, we, we, you know, we, we, we created this pipeline that, that put some data in, but you have to go rewrite all your code now because we did some weird stuff, right? We want, we want, her, to be, we want to be able, her to be able to deploy her code as she uses it on her desktop in, in her development environment, which is a lot more constrained, and we want to be able to solve all the, all the hard problems to reconstruct the data in a way that she needs to see it. So that's what we did. And this is kind of a picture of the architecture of our Kafka connector. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward problem. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Kafka, you've probably done this before. Um, we, read, we, we have a, a, a pool of consumers that reads uh, from, top, from a topic. Uh, we do, a, a, we do a, a partition grouping first, and then we do a second grouping, which is based on, on Windows. And we, we manage the timestamps, and we, when we're sure that a window, uh, all the data, we, when we're sure that we've seen all the data for a given window, we release that to the next stage in the process, which is an async request handler that manages all the orchestration of asynchronous processing, including the case where I might want to hit a breakpoint somewhere in a debug environment, and I need to stop the whole world for a while while I sit and play with some data, right? So, so those were the, our basic requirements. We did an okay job with that. Um, and the, the consequences of that is the programming model that we ended up with for the user is actually quite nice. Um, we basically have an input stream, we do something to it, it turns it into an output stream. And the user model in MATLAB is really just working with timetable data types. So the user gets to work with things with the kind of data types that they're used to, and we take care of all the hard problems behind the scenes for them. So what happens is a, a, a window comes in, we apply the MATLAB function, you saw this earlier. Uh, we, we produce an output that goes into our output stream and we store our state, this is our model state that we have to update on each iteration. We store that into our Redis cache and we just keep doing that. We read the old state in, we apply that to the function, we produce output, we store the state again, and we just keep doing that, right? And that's how our, our stream processing logic works. So what I'm gonna show now is uh, before we actually are ready to turn on our production system, we, we actually do want to support debugging in the production environment, right? Because there's a huge leap. When, you, when you're on your desktop and you're in production, there's this enormous leap that you have to take, you know, because the environments are, are, are very, very different. And so what, what we've done is um, we've developed a capability that lets you just debug your, stream, fun your streaming, stream processing function uh, in, in uh, your desktop MATLAB. And what I'm showing here in this video is uh, we're gonna open a project. This is the project that we actually used that Heather showed earlier that we used to package our code. Uh, we're gonna actually start a session and what we're gonna be doing actually is consuming both streams now into our MATLAB. We're actually consuming the raw data we're publishing the results of the raw data back to Kafka, and then we're consuming that result stream also into the same session. We're gonna debug both of them. So what I'm debugging right now is my input data. I can uh, inspect my variables, and here's a, a view uh, of the table that I showed earlier uh, of live data as it's happening. Um, while we're, we're, we're at a breakpoint here, we've actually paused all the, all the Kafka topics, so they're not, they're not complaining, they're, they know what we're doing. Uh, we can also look at this, our state, this is our model. And um, what I did is I created a little dummy function so that I could publish my result stream. I wanna just look at what I'm actually publish, publishing into my results while the stream is processing. And this, this allows me to do that. And in this case, my result stream is actually very simple. It's only a single row, right? And, but I can, I, can look at the, I can actually look at the data in tabular form and I can, I can uh, reason on it, and I'm gonna, this, I'm gonna assume that this data looks okay, I actually don't know, but uh, it's, it's, uh, You're good. it's fine. <laughs> so uh, what I'm gonna do na next is um, finish our application. The last step in our process is we're going to um, 
we're going to we're going to build a Kibana dashboard that we can present to the um, plant operator. So so while all this was happening, we were ingesting all this data behind the scenes through kind of a cold path um, into Elasticsearch. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to we're going to we're going to finish our sprint. We're going to produce a basic dashboard, and we're going to share it with the uh, plant operator. The plant operator isn't here right now, so I'm going to let Heather take, take, take control again, and she's going, to, she's going to walk us through the last few steps in the process. Thanks, Jim. Like you saw, the plant operator is still back home uh, dealing with his pumps and his, all of his headaches. <laughs> but hopefully, this will help him. Uh, because now we've actually got a dashboard. We don't have Wi-Fi I don't, th right now for this very talk, but we're actually right outside, uh, so you can come and check it out. Um, it, as, as the plans operator, they tell me they chose Cabana because of the time series, uh, visualizations, and the ease in creating those. And we can actually now make some decisions. And so this will show us the live streaming data. We can see how many um, pumps are being blocked or leaking, and then we also can get a good estimate of the remaining useful life. Now, of course, we'll probably want to build this out even more whenever, you know, once the plant operator starts to really get his hands on it, once he's done mopping up all the pump uh, failures. And so, you know, bring Jim back here, let's have a team retrospective, right? We do this at the end of every sprint. And so, we did it. That's the most important thing. We literally did it. Uh, three weeks, and we built out the entire architecture with all the models, and it works. Enough for a three-week sprint. Um, but really, you know, so the, how did we get there? Uh, the digital twin was super helpful. Again, we don't want to break all of our pumps, so we can uh, generate the data, train the models, and generate loads of data so we can actually be pretty confident about those. And then, you know, you saw how fast it was uh, for the prototyping. Of course, I want to go back to that, but I at least have something that I can just stick in production so I know that it's going to work, for one thing, and it's going to give some kind of reasonable result so then I can come back in the next sprint and really kind of dive into the model a bit more. And then, of course, you know, Jim showed a lot of the, you know, it's fairly easy to kind of pull, pull this together in a cloud platform and use, you know, best-in-class uh, architectures for this. And so, again, you know, next steps, we'll obviously take a look at that model. That was, like, five seconds. I think you usually spend a little bit more time on machine learning. Um, and then we'll get our real pump data, make sure we test out our system again, and, uh, of course, you know, do some customization, a little tweaks probably in the architecture to make sure you know, things are stitching together well, security, those kinds of things. But we did it. We're going to celebrate. We're going out tonight for Tapas. Please join us. Uh, and <laughs> if, if not before then, She's we'll paying. see you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pay. I, I'm very happy about my models being successfully. Uh, actually, the plant operator will pay because his yeah. headaches are gone. And so, um, we've, again, we're right outside here, so we invite you to come out and have a mojito and chat about some of this, and we can show you the actual dashboard uh, real time. I think some of the guys back home are even working on it as we speak. Um, so there's some resources, you know, uh, the reference architectures are on GitHub, you know, there's lots of examples and things to walk through, and we really look forward to talking to you, so please come visit. Thank you. We probably have time for questions. I don't know if that's the thing. Yes. yes, it's a thing. So if anyone has any questions, we could do that. That's the moment that you ask the question, they make you the question, and they put you up, improve. Okay, okay. so they taste you. They that's okay. You. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so I'll just have to get oh, started. One question. Oh, yay, good. He's I was, the I was guy that had made more questions in the whole day. With that, this one, three in a row, bam, 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 always. That's good, so he gets an ape for participation. Yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the, for the talk. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I like to do some questions because, um, well, and it's interesting. And we love that you make questions. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my question is, um, as, as data scientists, we oftentimes work in an in, in office and such. And, and for this particular project, uh, did you go to no, the actual no, plant? No, 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 or yeah. did the physics person on your team go there? Or, do you actually move there and consult with the person, with, with person, person? That's a good question. You want to? I, I mean, I guess we could both handle that, right? Yeah. Either. Um, in 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 real life, uh, we would do that, right? And we work with lots of customers directly, and we have field people that go, and and work with them, and and what you're seeing here is a very agile approach to this problem. Right. What we're doing is instead of going to a plan, instead of going and meeting with, with a customer and getting, 
you know, six months worth of requirements documents, what we did is we got a few, we asked a few questions and we came back and we came back th three or four weeks later and showed him a piece of software, right? And, and that's really the, the, I think that's, I think that's really the way to do this, right? Um, and what we did for our part is, is of course, we're the math works, so we have all these tools available to us, right? Uh, we, 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 we basically took these tools, put them all together, and, and, and you know, did it. Um, this isn't actually, I, actually it is. Is this a real, is, do we have mm -hmm. a real, yeah, so the, can, we, this, can we say um, who would, can Yeah, we, I believe, yeah, so there's, uh, we can come and talk more, this is a Baker Hughes, yeah. uh, so that this was. Oh, ba you know, okay, we, good, we Baker have, Hughes, so we're allowed to yeah. talk about Baker Hughes? Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah, so, uh, so. <laughs> we do have slides uh, showing, yeah. showing all that, um, yeah. but there, there are, uh, you know, we have lots of physical models that are definitely informed by lots of research and lots of knowledge from the, you know, community. We, you know, like I said, lo lots of, uh, Jim mentioned probably field people, you know, in it, you know, build up this model over a couple of years maybe, um, but yeah, we just kind of took it and put it into production. Great. Any more question? I have a question. Yes, more question. Uh, 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 it's something like what he, he asked. It's, it's about the, not the modeling, but the use of the predictions, uh, taking into account the data from the sensors in the real world, because uh, you you can synthesize the model with a simulated uh, data, and that's great because you know a very good physics-based model, and it's great. But when you take data for the real world, it's quite dirty. It's a lot. <laughs> it's more dirty than data. And how do you uh, take all this noise? How do you modelize the noise in the inher in inheriting the in the data from the real sensors? just to matching with the model in the synthesized, I, I don't know if you model the noise in the physics base, so you can match and, but, but it's not only white noise, because it's not a, it's very non-linear systems, because it's a rotatory, and it's quite difficult to take all this no white noise and say, okay, it's great, the model is okay, and what, this is one. And the other is, for for example, I have some. I I, I work in this in this domain, and I find difficult in how to say. I find difficult in identify the anomalies in that are not identified previously. For example, uh, it's quite recently that you know that this piece is too broken because you know that this piece is the the soft the 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 pain points in the system, but if you want to detect anomalies in a subsystem that you have no tag, it's quite difficult, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, it so is. I can take the first one, probably, Yeah. Uh, the you, data cleaning. So yeah. the model, yeah, sure enough, we introduced noise uh, in the Simulink model itself. And then I also added a little here and there to kind of make sure that the uh, signal processing was going to be robust enough. Yeah. Just, you know, random noise, basically. Um, but I did, for sure, I mean, although the, you know, simulated data was, was all existing, um, you know, thinking through, like, obviously we're going to have missing timestamps, like maybe a sensor is going to drop out, go down. I mean, some of that's taken care of a little bit in the uh, Kafka part, because they do some of the, you know, synchronization and everything. But I also still need to think th about all that. So, you know, uh, removing the missing data, rescaling, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, sort of typical challenges. Um, but yeah, the, the signal part, uh, there's some, I actually consulted with some of my colleagues even for that because, uh, you know, we have some pretty sophisticated stuff, you know, I just kind of dabble in signal processing, but uh, they, they, you know, showed different ways of introducing the noise, and I think we showed the app a little bit, and that actually is very helpful because you can kind of play around a little and see what kind of filters you might use. Um, so, yeah, it's a little trial and error, like the real data would probably inform a little bit more. Uh, but we try to make it as realistic just based on our prior knowledge from other kind of projects, you know, when the sensors fail and let us life, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other Yeah, this, the, the, so the second question was about, was about uh, real data and about anomalies, right? So certainly, certainly the next phase in this project, and in, when we do these kind of projects, the next phase is always to get real data, right? And, and in, in many cases, we can't, you know, we still have to prove to the customer that that you know that 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 
we have to we have to basically make a value sell to the customer that says, look, getting real data is actually going to be really costly for you, and. In many cases, showing a prototype like this is a way to kind of motivate that cost and, and get management behind it. That can be a really big challenge, yes, as you, I'm sure you know. Indeed, indeed. Uh, yeah. For example, the sensor needed to detect some kind of anomaly. Yeah. They had uh, uh, sampling frequency very low, and it's like you have a filter that cannot detect this anomaly. And it's like, okay, it's like you put a hand uh, in front of your eyes, and you can't see the anomaly, even if you can mobilize it. And it's quite frustrating. And these sensors are mm, very expensive right now, mm -hmm. and they're not implemented in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we've tried a little uh, to implement probably the next phase, uh, some system identification stuff before even. Uh, so it, maybe the, uh, the dashboard could have some indications of other things that could be going on. Like you said, uh, you know, we can kind of build out a little bit more yeah. mm -hmm. breadth in what sort of anomalies could be detected, even you know, unsupervised learning or something to, to get some indicators. For sure. That'd be cool. Thanks. We'll put it on for the next sprint. I have <laughs> okay, two last things to say, one good and one bad. Which one do you prefer first? Bad. The bad. The time is over. Oh. Time's up. OK. That good one, they want to continue ask answering question so if you want if you like right outside you can go yep. outside yeah. ask the expert and they be really yeah. glad Heather and Jim to answer all your questions so big applause for him for them thank you thank you thank it's you been an honor thank, thank you so thank much you. Awesome.